Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about mobile apps and mental health. The smartphone has proven to be an incredible platform that enables us to do all kinds of things that we could never do before. And now it's extending its reach into the field of mental health. I have two guests. Julia Hoffman is a clinical psychologist and mobile apps lead at the Department of Veterans Affairs, where she develops apps to help veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other mental and emotional difficulties. Nicholas Chapa leads the mobile team at the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab, where the goal is to find ways to enable people to overcome destructive behavior patterns and develop positive and healthy ones instead. He was inspired to get into this work because of his desire to empower people all over the world. Julia, Nick, welcome both of you to the program. Thank you. Julia, before we talk about your apps, maybe you could give a little bit of background on post-traumatic stress disorder. What is it and what is the general approach for treating it? Well, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is also called PTSD for short, is a pretty common disorder among uh, individuals across the, across the globe, Americans in general, and specifically mm -hmm. America's veterans. And those are the folks that I work with. It occurs in about 7% of Americans and from about 10 to 20% of, of veterans who've been deployed. Basically, it's a normal reaction to a horrible situation of any kind. It can be combat, it can be a natural disaster, a traumatic experience like rape or assault. Um, and it has a couple of key features where the person re-experiences that event. They think about it again and again in the form of nightmares or even while they're awake. They avoid thinking about it or talking about it as much as possible. They maybe feel numbed out. Um, and, and then they also have some arousal symptoms. So they may startle easily, get angry, that kind of stuff. So is it some kind of emotion that they try to repress, but they're not always able to repress it? That's, that's almost exactly it. I would say that the hallmark of PTSD is avoidance. So most of, the, most of the most effective treatments for PTSD see PTSD as a, as a disorder primarily of avoidance, where a person really wants to get away from this very unpleasant series of thoughts, and they want to put that event behind them. And in doing so, they, do, they work so hard to stay away from it that they never actually really process it. Most of the effective treatments, which luckily there are at least two um, that we provide in the Department of Veterans Affairs, are based on the concept of, of needing to work through that trauma and really experience it or expose yourself to it in order to, to get past it. Do most people respond well to the treatment? The people who get those treatments do respond well, yeah. They have excellent rates of success. So those are prolonged exposure therapy and cognitive processing therapy. Both are forms of cognitive behavioral therapy, and they happen in treatment with a trained behavioral provider, either one-on-one -on -one or in groups. And, can you get rid of it so it's gone for good, or is there always a danger that it's going to come back again? Uh, no, you can get rid of it so that it's gone for good. I think that uh, there has been some lore in the past that PTSD is a disorder that you're stuck with for life, um, and that comes from a previous era before we had the excellent science that we have now, um, and, and we're really actively engaging veterans in care that's specifically designed to move them through the trauma. Now, you're developing mobile apps to help people with PTSD. Do you have any apps that are actually in use? Yes, yes. We have the PTSD Coach, which was the first of its kind, um, which, it, which has been available since April of 2011 on the iTunes Store and, and also on, the, on Google Play. Um, and so I can actually demonstrate that one for you now. It's okay, you have an iPad sitting right here, so yeah. maybe we could just bring up the iPad and take a look at how we can deal with PTSD. So it's important to note that the PTSD coach is really for people who are thinking about PTSD care, who think they might have PTSD, who know they have PTSD. They may be veterans, they may not be. It's for a very broad swath of the population. And so uh, we tried to make it match up with some of the most important elements of cognitive behavioral therapies that we found to be effective. So is this designed to help people determine if they have PTSD? Yes, that's part of it. So the first area is the learn area. And you can just get the basics. Learn about PTSD. What is it? How do I know if I have it? What are the basics about, um, about who develops it and why it develops? And you can also learn about professional care. 
for some people, they think they have PTSD and they may not be willing to engage in, in care. For veterans, that's mostly uh, for reasons of, of stigma or the, just the logistics of getting to mental health treatment. So this hopefully demystifies the treatment a bit for them so that they can then uh, move into treatment if they need it. The self-assessment button leads a person to take the actual assessment that's used across all VA and DOD uh, uh, mental health systems. So this is some kind of test where you see if you match certain symptoms? That's right. So it's 17 items. It's called the PCL, the PTSD checklist. And it is the validated measure that's been used in most research for PTSD and, and as a monitoring measure across both federal systems. You can track your history so you can see how you're doing over time, and you can schedule assessments to track how you're doing um, and come back in the future. I'm going to skip to the last button for a second, which is find support. What we find is that sometimes all people need in order to get the care that they need is a little bit of a nudge. So we found that uh, if you hit this get support right now button, you can actually just call 911 or you can call the Veterans Crisis Line, which is our suicide hotline, um, or you can contact people that you've set up in, from your own contact list, from your own phone or, or device. Uh, it may seem a little bit silly to have these things pre-programmed in, 911. Why wouldn't a person just call that on their phone if they already are holding a phone, right? But what we found is actually that people have called the Veteran Crisis Line and said, my phone told me to call. I don't know what's wrong. I'm really upset. But my phone told me to call. So it's working. It makes it easier. Right. It makes it very obvious, and sometimes that's all you need when you're really distraught is a nudge in the right direction, in the direction of some positive coping behavior. You can also find professional care in this last button. Uh, you can find professional care in the, in the VA or DOD systems so or abroad. So that would be a directory where you could look up somebody who matched your uh, specialty? Or right. Your there's, P there's direct links to PTSD specialty programs. There's links to SAMHSA programs for people who maybe aren't veterans, et cetera. Now, is this app finished, or do you have ambitions to add more and make it do more? Well, so uh, the third button is the most important one. I'm going to show you that, and then I'll tell you, because I think Nick is a critical okay. part to our desire to do more with it. Okay. Um, in the Manage Your Symptoms button, you can tell it whatever's wrong with you. Um, I'm worried and anxious. It, I give it a score, and it gives me something to do. Something that's pretty innocuous like this, maybe I don't like it, I give it a thumbs down, and I want a new tool. I can keep going and getting new tools until I find something that I really like. This will go through a whole animated progressive muscle relaxation with audio so that I can really calm down if I need to in the so moment. So the, the goal of this is essentially to get the person to relax. Right, exactly. PTSD patients said, we just want something to do in the moment when we're stressed, wherever we are. So this was our version one. We based it on feedback from about 80 veterans saying what it was they did and did not in, want in the initial feature set. And we really do hope to gather as much feedback as possible in order to make version 2.0 even more focused on what the veterans with PTSD actually need. Now, is the main treatment relaxation, and if so, does, is there any reliance on pharmaceuticals for that, or is it all just kind of mental relaxation? Well, everything that's in here is based on cognitive behavioral theory. It's all going to be something that the person is going to do for themselves with no, uh, with no pharmaceuticals. That kind of thing, really, we, we tend not to try to, to deal with via an app because we can potentially have some safety concerns. When you talk about cognitive therapy, does that mean that you're asking the person to basically reframe the trauma in his head, getting, uh, you know, looking at the initial trauma in a different way, which makes it seem less threatening? To some extent, that's true. I think uh, the basic principle of cognitive behavioral therapy is that our thoughts are connected to our behaviors, are connected to our emotions. If any of those get out of whack, then we need to realign that triangle by re, mostly by working on thoughts, because it's so hard to just directly change your emotions. Is there anything known about why some people are more susceptible than others? Two people could both have had the identical traumatic experience, but only one of them develops PTSD. Has any work been done to determine what are the factors that predict uh, the likelihood of PTSD? There is a whole field of literature about exactly that question, about the, the various risks and res risk and resilience factors for PTSD. Some of them are genetic risks. There are biomarkers, certainly. There are things that happen in the moment of the trauma or upon returning home that can increase your risk. One really uh, easily accessible example is uh, for Vietnam veterans. What happens when you return home, when they returned home, was that they did not get any support from the general public and frequently felt um, 
like they were like they were left alone with their problems. Like their sacrifice wasn't worth it, maybe. Right, or that it wasn't recognized or appreciated. And um, that experience could actually lead to greater incidence of PTSD, that lack of social support following a trauma. But gender, all kinds of things can contribute to whether or not a person actually gets PTSD. But you're right, as well as what kind of trauma. If a person is a prisoner of war, they have a huge likelihood of getting PTSD versus if they're in a car accident, it, it may be significantly less likely. Okay, great. So we're going to be talking some more a little bit later, but now I'd like to turn my attention to Nick. Nick, you work for something called the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. What exactly is that all about?